a very unusual person uh, to become a sculptor was Mary Edmonia Lewis. Now she generally uses her middle name, Edmonia Lewis, so that's what we'll be calling her. You'll notice that we don't even know her death date. And the reason for that is there aren't records. She is a person of mixed race, and records are not always kept terribly well. We have a number of photographs of her, as you'll see. Edmonia Lewis was the first important black sculptor in America. You know, there may have been, um, in fact, there probably, there were uh, some artists who, uh, say one who carved uh, a, a cane, for example, uh, you know, did certain carvings like this, but she was a professional sculptor uh, with uh, a large body of works. Uh, and so she's the first important black sculptor in America. She's also the first important mixed race sculptor in America uh, because her mother was a Chippewa Indian in New York and her father was a free black man in New, New York. Um, she actually was raised by her mother's people. I think her mother died. Uh, but the Native Americans, uh, which still, who still were, the tribe was still in upstate New York at that time, uh, raised, the, raised her as, she was raised as a Native American. She was raised as, as a, she was raised as a Native American. Her Indian name translates as wildfire, which is <laughs> pretty interesting because <laughs> uh, she certainly is an unusual, an unusual person. Uh, that she was able to do what she did is just really remarkable. Um, she did have the backing from some of the um, abolitionist groups, and she was sponsored to attend Oberlin College, which is in Oberlin, Ohio. Oberlin has a long history, a very proud history, of being an area that was very abolitionist and of having the liberal heritage of allowing not only white men, but also women, and in this case, a woman who is black or mix, mixed race, uh, to attend Oberlin College. Uh, it was the first co-ed college and the first interracial college in the United States, and of course is. They have a very fine museum and art history program. <laughs> She had some problems at college. Um, she was accused of poisoning her roommates, who were white, I think she was probably the only black there, with drugged wine. I mean, they didn't die, you know, they were, they were drugged. And uh, so by poisoning, we're not meaning killing, uh, they were knocked out or something. Um, there wasn't evidence, there was an accusation uh, and so we don't have any idea what really happened. Uh, could the girls themselves have taken too much and then blamed their roommate? I don't know. Um, I think when someone writes a book of Ammonia Lewis, they're probably going to have to go through court records and see what evidence was actually submitted. Um, she was taken off to jail, and what was really horrible was um, some vigilantes broke in and beat her up. Um, she also had supporters, people who just said, this is not true. And uh, she had a very famous lawyer came for her case and argued the case. And uh, when the judge ruled there was not evidence to prove this, uh, her supporters literally carried her from the courtroom on their shoulders. Um, so this is one of the probably first examples that actually gets in court um, about a black person being accused of a crime with insubstantial evidence, uh, possibly fabricated, we don't know. Um, and um, she is, she is I, I can't say she was exonerated, they just said she didn't have insufficient evidence and uh, she was forced to leave the school. Um, she went to Boston. <laughs> And obviously there were plenty of people who believed that she had had nothing to do with it. Um, you know, I believe that there were plenty of people that believed she was innocent. Um, she 
uh, went to Boston. Um, she met uh, a neoclassical sculptor. Uh, it was really interesting. It's like, I can do that. <laughs> he says, okay. <laughs> and he gives her some uh, clay, and he, you, know, you often would work from uh, plaster casts and use as models. So there was a plaster cast of a hand, and he makes her copy this, which is pretty hard to be perfect. Like Frank hands are, are uh, something that, you know, a little bit difficult. Uh, he was impressed at what she did, uh, sort of off the bat without uh, any training, and agreed to give her informal exercises and training. Um, I, the first work was supposed to be a medallion of John Brown, and I couldn't find a picture of this. I did find a bust of John Brown uh, by Edmonia Lewis, so I'm going to use this rather than a relief sculpture. Um, so we see you know, abolitionist themes already. Uh, her first artistic success, which actually you know, made her money and, and helped her to, uh, to live, um, she made a medallion of Colonel Robert Shaw, who was the white commander of black soldiers. Uh, there were no black commanders of black soldiers during the Civil War. And in fact, I suspect, um, I don't know who the first black officer would be. But I know they had white commanders well into the 20th century. Um, and uh, Shaw came from an abolitionist family. And they, there was a, a, during the Civil War, they, they prom many of the people promoted uh, the idea that the soldiers, that, they, the, that there should be black soldiers. Um, and they fought very bravely. Uh, Shaw died in the battle for Charleston, South Carolina. And he was uh, you know, a hero. Uh, and so she did this medallion, and she sold replicas. And it was, if it was a medallion, it would have been a relief sculpture, so I wonder if they were cast, but I don't know. Uh, at any rate, by selling the, the uh, if they were prints, we called them a print run, but uh, the, uh, they issued a certain number of, uh, of uh, copies. And they still do this from time to time. Uh, and uh, this was able to finance her trip to Rome in 1865. And I might point out uh, that uh, she was, she, one of the things she wanted to do was prove that she could carve herself. And she did show people that she could carve her, carve her statues herself, or at least carve these uh, 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 smaller works. Uh, but she didn't, like everybody else, uh, when she got to Rome, uh, have the skilled stonesmen. Her first artistic success was the medallion of Colonel Robert Shaw. And I could not find a reproduction of a medallion or a relief sculpture of, uh, by Edmonia Lewis of, of Colonel Shaw. Uh, I did find this uh, bust that was uh, uh, said to be by Edmonia Lewis that is, was on the internet. So I'm just showing you that instead. Um, Colonel Shaw uh, was a, the white commander of a troop of black soldiers, and he died in the Battle of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he was from an abolitionist family, and one of the things that they were promoting was for the right of uh, free black men uh, to fight uh, on the cause of uh, the Civil War, to fight uh, for the emancipation. And, um, Colonel Shaw died in battle, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I don't know when they first allowed black men to command, uh, but I know that there were white commanders of black troops uh, you know, well into the 20th century. Um, she sold 100 replicas of her medallion, and this was able to finance the trip to Rome in 1865. Now, one of the things, of course, um, you had to have letters of introduction. So she had a letter of introduction uh, to Harriet Hosmer. And she comes to Rome, and she meets Hosmer. And Hosmer arranges for Edmonia Lewis to study with her own teacher, John Gibson. So. You know, Lewis has seen neoclassicism, and now uh, she's actually studying with a neoclassical artist. So her, sta her, her style is neoclassicism. Um, the f one of the first works that she did in, in Rome was known as The Freed Woman, 
It would be a black slave who has been newly emancip emancipated. Alas, that work is lost. Now, one of the interesting things about Edmonia Lewis's work is that uh, quite a bit of it that's recorded as existing has been lost, and some of it is now being found. Um, her major statue of Cleopatra. We'll talk about that. And I was um, at a conference in Cincinnati, and they took us in the Cincinnati Museum of Art. They took us into the room where they were doing the restorations and the, the conservatory. And there, sitting on a table, <laughs> was something that I had never seen a picture of. Um, was the marriage of Hiawatha and Minnehaha? And I said, "Is that a Imodia Lewis?" And they said, "Yes." <laughs> So we'll tell you about that. So that was a newly discovered work. At any rate, some of her work is lost. So we don't know if this has, is destroyed or if it could possibly be found sometime. Um, what we do have is a work which is at actually at Howard University. Uh, it's called Forever Free. It was created in 1867. And it shows uh, male and female slaves liberated by the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, so what is happening is their chains are being broken. Uh, they are looking upward you know, to God, uh, who has uh, presumably helped have the, the uh, uh, helped to liberate them. Uh, the woman has her hands clasped in, in uh, joy and prayer. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a, I, mean, I guess you say very typical neoclassical, except for the subject. Uh, it celebrates the passage of the 13th Amendment, which forbids slavery. And there is, I suppose, an irony in the fact that all her statues are in white marble, even when she's depicting um, African Americans. Um, but I don't know that they did ebony statues at that time. But certainly, um, white marble would be considered to be uh, the material of high art. Uh, for neoclassicism. So. Uh, many of her works do have themes that can relate to uh, her background, uh, either sympathy, sympathy for the African Americans, who she was never enslaved, but who were, um, or, as we'll see, the Native American background. However, she does say that she doesn't want to be judged just as the, you know, the African American uh, artist, she, she wants to be judged you know, as an artist. Um, this work, Hagar in the Wilderness, uh, they're not sure of the exact date, it is in the National Museum of American Art in Washington, D.C. And I think it's just under life size. I'm not sure of the exact measurements, but it's, it's around life size, maybe it's slightly smaller. Um, it is uh, a biblical subject from Genesis. Hagar was uh, the maidservant of Sarah, uh, the wife of Abraham. And you may remember that Sarah was not able to bear a child, so she gave the maidservant, i.e. her slave, to her husband to have a child by. And uh, so the situation is something that uh, slaves for countless times would have found, uh, you know, that they're just uh, they have no say in the matter of who's having sex with them. Uh, at any rate, uh, Hagar conceives the child Ishmael, traditionally the um, ancestor of the Arabs. And then Sarah con conceives the child Isaac. And once she has a child, she doesn't want uh, this other woman with her child uh, around uh, and Hagar is abandoned by Abraham in the wilderness. And there's just a very moving passage in Genesis where she, she cannot bear to see her son die, and she you know, turns away. Um, and you know, he, he does survive, obviously. Um, so here is Hagar uh, with only God to rely on. Uh, Now, although I have some people say she has African features, some people say she doesn't. I don't, don't see it particularly, but who knows. Uh, but at any rate, she is an African slave because uh, we're talking about North Africa here. Uh, the uh, land of Ur uh, is where 
Abraham came from, so that whole area of the Middle East, uh, which is, is part of Africa. So she is an African slave with a son by her master who's been abandoned to die, and God intervenes. Uh, so it's a story that has um, current meaning uh, for the time. And Edmontonia Lewis says, I have a strong sympathy for all women who have struggled and suffered. It's neoclassical in the sense that you have this uh, somewhat idealized figure, um, you know, so sort of calm, and yet there are some things that depart slightly from neoclassicism. Uh, her nose is not perfectly straight. Her brow is furrowed. In other words, she's not an emotionless figure with a, a face that, that shows no emotion. And uh, this is one of the things that they've suggested, that there's a sort of African reference in the idea that the hair is uh, crinkled and uh, that gives you a more African uh, texture to the hair. Um, the other side of her heritage was not forgotten either. Uh, she created a work, and this is a small-scale sort of tabletop size work, also in the National Museum of American Art in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's known as the Old Arrow Maker and His Daughter. Uh, from 1872. Uh, in this case, the theme is Native American. It is created with accuracy. It's not a kind of romanticized uh, view of uh, Native Americans uh, that, you know, that looks more like an uh, ancient Greek statue. It's shown here with you know, a certain amount of realism. Um, Lewis was raised with Chippewas, and uh, she did uh, learn the crafts of, the, of her people. Uh, she hunted, she uh, made moccasins, uh, and so here we see uh, this, uh, this uh, family uh, unit, essentially. Uh, the man who is making the arrows, you see the little uh, dead deer at the feet, and the textures are really Interesting. Um, if you look closely at this, you know, so details here, uh, you can see that the textures of the garment, it's not all smoothed over like a neoclassical work, but the textures are accurate. Uh, and she's really trying to give you a, 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 an accurate picture. You can see the, the, the style of moccasins even. Now, we might contrast this with another work of art, which was also in the uh, National Museum of uh, Women, uh, excuse me, this is in the National Museum of American Art. Uh, and this is a full-size, large statue. It's also by Hiram Powers, and it's called The Last of the Tribe. And of course, the reference is to the fact that uh, many of the tribes of Native Americans, um, the tribes were dying out. Uh, many of the eastern tribes were being pushed into the west, which you know, was not their, their areas, um, and many of them were, were dying. Uh, and so this is supposed to be the last of the tribe. And as you can see, it's what I was talking about, a very neoclassical looking work uh, here. Uh, the only thing that tells you she's an Indian is her skirt. Uh, and maybe, maybe she's got moccasins too, uh, but she's you know, naked from the top to the waist. Uh, and uh, it looks very much like a, a neoclassical Greek statue inspired by ancient Greece. Uh, so great contrast in what they're trying to do uh, with the theme of the uh, Native Americans. With Lewis, it's a small scale. Uh, she's interested in the detail. She's interested in the accuracy. With Powers, he doesn't know anything about <laughs> Native American life. Um, we have an idealized neoclassical work uh, that is uh, life-size, you know, and uh, all he has to do is change the garment and he can change the name, actually. Uh, she, uh, there was an interest in Native Americans at this time. And one of the things that um, brought about this interest was uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, The Song of Hiawatha. And uh, so here we have her, Edmonia Lewis did a bust of uh, Longfellow. And there's uh, two versions of that. They said the other one I think was in, at Harvard. Uh, this one is the one from Liverpool. Um, this is the picture. <laughs> 
right here, here. Uh, this is the marriage of Hiawatha. So Edmonia Lewis decided to capitalize, I guess, on uh, Longfellow's po poem, the popularity of Longfellow's poem. And of course, who, who better than to create uh, statues of, with an American, a Native American theme? So she created, uh, it will say, some busts of Hiawatha and Minnehaha and several figural groups. Uh, Hiawatha's wooing, I have not seen anything of that. It may be one of those lost works. And something that we thought was lost, uh, the marriage of Hiawatha and Minnehaha. Uh, but as you see, they found it. And um, I found this picture on the web, and I'm going to assume it's the one that I saw under restoration uh, in Cincinnati. Um, where they found it was it had been put outside uh, in a, as a garden ornament. And of course, it had been weathering for over 100 years. Uh, at some point, I guess it had been dirty and pitted and, and whatever. And uh, parts had broken off, and they had glued them back on using cement. So, like, <laughs> um, and they had even painted it. I mean, now the, the surface is all porous now because of all the weather. And they would actually painted it with white paint to look like white marble, I guess. So it was in terrible condition. And uh, the restoration would have been um, you know, a difficult thing. Uh, they do marvelous things with restorations. Uh, as I say, I don't know. There were probably would have been several copies of this. OK, now we're going to look at uh, these uh, two busts of Hiawatha and Minnehaha. And I assume that, there may have, that some of these things may have been made in multiples. Um, I saw them in Detroit. They're somewhat smaller than life size. I think about 11 inches high. Minnehaha is around 11 inches high. Uh, Hiawatha has a little top knot, so he's slightly, slightly larger. Um, and you might notice that one of the things that uh, Edmonia Lewis does is she, she usually has very shallow uh, cuts to her um, when she's carving um, and to her, her images. Uh, she doesn't deeply undercut uh, the way, say, someone like a Baroque artist like Bernini would do. Well, that's very much part and parcel of uh, uh, neoclassical tradition, although um, it seems particularly, um, I don't know, it's really marked in her work. Uh, there's a different view of Minnehaha, uh, sort of looking down. And you can see that what looks, looks like a turban is actually a feather. 